Okay, I'm back. Back inside, but back. I'll wait to see if people connect and if you can hear me. Okay, uh, I'm not getting any comments. So, I'm not sure if Still can't hear me? All right. Well, then we're going to switch over to the phone. Oh. Okay. I can hear you. All right. That's good. I thought, I, I thought it was I can't hear you. All right. So we're back. Sorry about that. I. It's a mystery. Um, it worked yesterday when I was working with the Friars general council meeting, but Facebook hates me. That's what it is. Well, that was the backyard. It was just so pretty. I thought I'd share it with you, but I guess it was not to be. So we will pick up from where we left off, which is... Come on. Wakey, wakey. Um, kind of sounds like a need that this one when we left off last week we had Paul and Silas had been um, beaten with rods arrested and then tossed in prison but not just tossed in prison they were put in stocks to make sure that they didn't you know they, they their actually stocks were also pretty uncomfortable so there they are, suffering through that. And I wish this would just work for me. To... No. Word. Um, they were tossed in the very center of the prison because they figure that you know, if they were to try to break out, mind you, they're chained and, and bound and beaten, um, they still have to get through the entire prison. Now, remember, Paul is a person who writes, t when he writes the Romans, that God uses everything for the good for those who love him. And here's a, a time where he experiences that. So he writes about what he knows, not just making things up. So Acts 16, verse 25. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains were unfastened. So the Paul and Silas endure being chained and uncomfortable and beaten and bruised uh, for a few hours. Then the Lord shakes things up, so to speak. But before the earthquake, let's look at what Paul and Silas have been doing. That's better. Don't feel like a child anymore looking up at you. All right. They're not moaning. They're not, you know, doing what you would expect in a prison, that that, that might be cursing, um, but they are singing and praying, of course, out loud, because people can hear them. Um, and because they're singing and praying, uh, in the position that they're in, they're in the center of the prison, all the rest of the prisoners can hear them. Again, God working the good out of what does not seem to be good at all. 
um, being beaten, chained, and imprisoned. But God working good out of that. Um, like I said, this wasn't the type of thing that the prisoners would have expected to hear from this place. In fact, when they saw them being led into the, they probably thought these guys are going to be miserable. But instead, they're holding a church service. Soon, what these men have heard changes the life of at least one man. But we should remember that Paul is in Philippi at this time. And Philippi is where the Philippians live. And when Paul writes to the Philippians later, he builds on this theme of being content under any circumstances, of finding joy in any circumstances, and to keep looking for your eternal reward. Um, it seems kind of hard to imagine that you would be doing that, um, but Paul writes from what he knows. He's not just saying, there, there, you'll be fine. Um, chances are the people he's writing to haven't been beaten uh, to with an inch of their lives, bound and chained. They're suffering. They're suffering from uh, the challenges of people who are trying to drum the faith out. But Paul knows of what he speaks and says, focus on the Lord. That's what he and Silas were doing. We're focusing on the Lord, not on themselves. And because of that, they had a um, wonderful, you know, experience. Because then this strong and sudden earthquake strikes the prison. Now, the circumstances that follow it's obvious that this event is supernatural in origin and in purpose. It's not just the building was shaken, all the doors popped open, and some magically, <laughs> or miraculously, all the chains are, are set loose. So those who are who chained to their cell walls, Paul and Silas, who were chained up themselves, are set free. That's not that's some powerful, magnificent earthquake that, that does that. And, and it's certainly the hand of God. It's not just a natural event. Um, but under any other circumstances, given the situation, put yourself in the situation. Every prisoner would have run out of the prison when they had the chance. Um, it's like, ooh, get out of jail free card. Unless, of course, they perceive that the source of the earthquake is something attributed to the worship of Paul and Silas. In which case, the prisoners would have been attracted to Paul and Silas to understand what kind of power they had that could accomplish such wonders. And as it was, they did. They hung around. They were, they were amazed. Like, how did this happen? Who are these people? So as we continue, when the jailer awoke, saw the prison doors opened, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that all the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? At the earthquake, the jailer awoke, which seems logical, unless he was really, really wiped out. Um, and, and we note immediately he wasn't hearing the worship that Paul and Cyrus, Silas were, had been conducting for the, the benefit of the rest of the jail. He didn't hear anything until the earthquake because he's outside the gate, outside the jail. But now he sees that all the drawers are, pro are, are swung open and he assumes what is natural, that they're gone. Um, and the penalty for losing even one prisoner was the death penalty, much less an entire jail full of people. So um, he, there he was. He was, rather than being put to death by the Romans, because they had creative ways of putting you to death, he was going to just end it all. The Romans had a very black and white view of such things. Uh, it's like, okay, you're in charge of this. You lost him you die. Um, and if you lost an entire prison, well, you're going to die a thousand times. <laughs> so, yeah, it might have been a whole lot better to just end it all. But Paul recognizes the man's predicament, probably because he, he knows Paul is a Roman. He knows 
the, the laws of Rome, um, but also I'm sure the jailer was panicked and he probably didn't panic in silence. So Paul cries out to him. Um, the cells were empty, but the prisoners hadn't left the prison. They went deeper in to join Paul and Silas. Instead of going out and every man for himself, it was, what are these men doing? What is different here? And so, so much like what Jesus did, which when he turned things around, people always said, oh, this is the way. And it's like, no, we're going to go that way. It's like, that doesn't make any sense. Well, to us, but in God's mind, in God's plan, it makes tremendous sense. So instead of them fleeing for their lives, looking out for themselves, they want to know, how is this possible? They are free to leave, but they don't leave. Because Paul and Silas' example have been so powerful that they want to see these people. They want to know what's going on. How can this possibly happen? Um, not thinking of themselves. And I think that's a wonderful thing to not put us first. Say, there's something greater here. What is it? They didn't understand the resurrection. They didn't understand Christ. Uh, their relationship to God was not one that Paul and Silas had. So they wanted, I want the faith that you guys have. Paul calls the jailer in. He, he comes in and you know calls for light again you think about that you're in charge of this jail and you're going in all the cells are open so all the, the prisoners are free well you're really risking your own life that you know they're still going to be in there and they're going to beat you to death um, and you know one person couldn't capture the whole crew but he, he looks and sees they're in Paul and Silas's cell. And remember, the Romans didn't incarcerate criminals very long. It was like, okay, there's no long-term prison population. It's like, you were in prison just to wait until it was the spot to kill you, because you were sentenced to death. So remaining in jail is essentially suicide. It's not like, well, I'm going to go to pr I'm going to go to court and justify. It. No, it's if you're already there, it's it's pretty bleak. It's not going to look good for you. It doesn't matter how innocent you might be. So, what does the jailer think when he comes upon this scene? Stunned isn't strong enough. In fact, the scene is so striking and unexpected that he immediately asks Paul and Silas the most important question anyone can ask. It's, he's so overwhelmed by what does not make any sense at all, he realizes it's got to be divine sense. Because human sense did not, these guys would not be here. How can I be saved? What do I need to do? To, because apparently I'm not doing the right things. The thing that motivated the jailer to ask this question was love. Why would they even love this? This is the man who's, you know, who's keeping them in prison. Why would they show any compassion? You know, why wouldn't it be every man for himself? And then when he was going to kill himself, why not let him kill himself? That, that's one less person we have to deal with when we escape from prison. Paul and Silas don't know this jailer. It's not like you were old friends and I'm, I, I'm doing you a favor. It was a man who chained them up, locked them up, put them away, and yet they're showing compassion and love. They're showing Christ and, and his life. And he knows that's not a human thing. That's got to be a divine thing. That's got to be something greater than, than we can imagine. If Paul and Silas left the prison, it makes sense that the prisoners who joined them would have followed. But they stayed right there. And when the jailer looks upon the scene, he must have recognized that the prison population was drawn to Paul and Silas. Again, it, you know, they weren't all innocent, so we're talking about people who might have been the bottom rung of society, and, and yet, instead of fleeing, they, they, they run to the Lord, actually. This is a kind of love and action, as far as the jailer is concerned. It's not saying, yes, I love you, but boom. <laughs> no, it's 
Um, we're putting our lives on the line to show our love for you, to show the love of Christ in us for you. Because it's not our love. Our love would say, okay, yeah, good luck. See ya. <laughs> I'm getting out of here and save my own life. He realizes that Paul and Silas determined to remain in the prison and thereby save the jailer's life. Again, I'm the man who, who imprisoned you. Why, why would you even think to do anything nice for me? They stopped him from committing suicide when they didn't have to. This is the love that the jailer experienced. This is the love that, that you know, we talk about peace that passes all understanding. Jesus calls us to the love. That only comes from, from the Spirit. The love that passes all understanding is when the Spirit is at work in us and we become Christ. We become just like Christ and show love. Christ who showed love to the point of suffering, torture, and death in, in absolute innocence to save us. And so it's, it's that kind of love that Paul and Silas are showing. It's that kind of love that changes people, that changes hearts, that raises the question, how can I be saved? We're not really sure if, if he meant it in the, the uh, soteriological sense, the sense of you know, salvation. Um, or did he mean, how can I be saved because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be you know, tried for this. But he knew that something was different. And whether he wanted to be saved from punishment, from our superiors, um, or saved from the being in the hand of his captors, uh, it doesn't matter. What matters is you have the power of God working with you. How, how could, what can I do to, to experience that power? Not realizing he's already experienced the power. He's experienced it in forgiveness and in love. But Paul tells them, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him, together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night, and washed their wounds. Immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought them into his house, and set food before them, and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. From jailer to uh, innkeeper, <laughs> and, and medic, uh, first Paul gives the jailer the gospel in, in simple terms. You know, did, didn't lay everything out. But then he adds that both the jailer and his household would be saved. What is Paul implying? With one man's salvation, how can it save everyone in his family? Well, we know this isn't the general testimony of Scripture. The meaning has to be found elsewhere in the content. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to be saved and, and you're all saved because I'm saved. Um, it, it's about that personal relationship with God. However, we think of baptizing babies. A lot of non-Catholic churches think we're crazy to, to baptize babies, and yet we see this happen repeatedly in Scripture, that their whole household was saved. That Paul is speaking to this man concerning God's plan for him and his family. And when his family witnesses that change in him, those who were, you know, capable, I mean, I, I didn't say his family were all adults, there must have been children, um, they just accept, okay, this is, this is God at work, even if we don't understand it, um, and this is a promise to us. Also, Paul and Silas speak to the jailer in conjunction with the call to believe, that, that it's not, that here's, here's the word of God, but it's not magic. It's not the, the book of black magic that if you say these words and in incantations, you can create earthquakes. No, it, it calls us to change our hearts. It calls us to be people of faith and to believe. And in believing, that's what Paul and Silas were showing, that incredible love, um, that incredible joy in the face of pain and suffering and sorrow. Um, and certainly, you want that. I mean, whether this guy was happy with his job as jailer, he wasn't as happy as Paul and Silas, who were, you know, in the midst of, you know, a terrible situation, and yet 
were foundationally happy. We're happy when they shouldn't be happy. Happy that blew away the, the, his mind. And yet, when they are free, the man believes in the gospel. He, he takes them home, washes their wounds, and asks for baptism. Can you imagine the emotions that night? The man who is inflicting their wounds is changed by the words of the gospel unto a, a person who feels compassion for those same wounds and treats them. I mean, just think about that, that the hurt you have caused, and you realize that you've caused that hurt, how much it must affect you when you've been converted, when you've been changed. And, you know, as you, it's not like you put them out of sight, as you're treating each one of those wounds, it's got to be like a stab to the heart, knowing that, why would they still show me love? Why would this God of theirs show me love? when I've been done these terrible things. The fact is, they are shown the love of God. They are given the promise. Um, and because of that, it changes their hearts. It's like, I don't know why anyone, much less God, would show me love because of what I've done and the mistakes I've made and the things that I thought were right but weren't. Remember, Paul did a lot of things when he was Saul thinking he was right and was wrong. Um, but if there's a God who loves me, despite that, despite my weaknesses, despite the, the wrongs that I've done, then I certainly want that. I want to believe and I want to follow. So he takes them to his own house, probably on the prison grounds, nourishes them, and they rejoice together. They celebrate as Paul and Silas were already doing, but now with a whole household, that salvation has come. We continue. Now when day came, the chief magistrate sent their police officers, saying, Release those men. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The chief magistrates have sent to release you. Therefore come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us in public without trial, men who are Romans, and they have thrown us into prison. Now they are sending us away secretly? No, indeed. But let them come themselves and bring us out. The police officers reported these words to the chief magistrates. They were afraid when they heard that they were Romans, and they came out and appealed to them. And when they had brought them out, they kept begging them to leave the city. They went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they saw the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. Paul could have said when, when the crowd was turning against him, we're Roman citizens, and that would have changed things. But now he keeps that in his back pocket. Well, I don't know what Toga's half pockets, but he holds that back. Um, and when it's appropriate, brings it out. Now those people who are, who are saying, okay, well, let him go. Then he says, oh, well, we're Roman citizens. Now they realize they're in trouble. If Paul pushes this, and that the powers that be in Rome will say, you beat an imprisoned Roman citizen without, you know, proper trial, and um, they were in deep trouble. However, he, he lets them know that, and then leaves. Again, it's not just we're following your will. Know that if we wanted to, we could make your lives miserable. But We'll leave. He goes back to Lydia's and reassures the rest of them that they're doing okay. Um, despite the earthquake damaging the prison, the prisoners return to their places. This means that likely some of the other prisoners were also led to their deaths. Were these new believers? Um, in some cases, certainly the answer would have to be yes, if not all the cases. Why would they even go back? And yet God asked them to remain in prison, even if it meant going to their own deaths, so the jailer could be brought to the point of his own salvation. Just as Paul himself later, Christians were required in the early church to go to their death for the sake of the gospel. Um, and they were really proto-martyrs. They had experienced salvation, and they knew that this isn't it. This isn't, life here is not 
what it's all about. There's something greater, and if it means death here, as long as I'm doing this for the glory of God, I will be in the Lord's presence. So the next morning, the leaders determined that to let Paul and Silas free. Um, the same men who beat them in the first place tell them, oh, he's free now. And then Paul pops the Roman citizen thing. Um, perhaps, I mean, that, that they were already free, but perhaps holding that over their heads saying, you know, you beat and imprisoned the Roman citizen uh, unjustly may have saved the lives of those who were in, in prison with them. They might have thought better about it saying, you know what, um, he could have really nailed us here. Uh, maybe we should just kind of like let them be. We don't want to get back to them that we were we mistreated these people and sent them to their death and then they have them say, really? Well, let me talk to the Roman authorities and show them the scars on my back and tell them with, with other people who witnessed this what happened. Um, they ask Paul for forgiveness and mercy and he shows them mercy with with a little bit of fear and hopes that they will show the same forgiveness and mercy to those men who have come to faith in prison. And he visits Lydia again before he moves on. And as we said last week, Luke uses this chapter to link Lydia, the slave girl, and the Roman jailer. Um, there, there's a, a thread there that he's, he's drawing. If we look at the spectrum he, that's represented here, we have a Jewish businesswoman dealing with the richest fabric in the empire. So at the top of the economic ladder is this woman. A slave girl possessed by a demon and, and used by unscrupulous men, the lowest station. She's a slave and, and being used. Then, decidedly, the Greek middle class of society, um, this jailer in the middle. Paul has entered Europe for the first time and he's influenced all levels of society, as Luke reflects in his narrative. The rich, the average person, the, the, the poorest of the poor. That God comes to us all, not just to those who seem to have it and get more. Paul has shown, sown the seeds of, of dissent that will be a continuous problem for his ministry, though, among the Jews. Now we rejoin in chapter 17, Paul's secondary missionary journal, journey. He, he left Philippi, and he, again he's headed west-southwest along the Aegean Sea. He still has Timothy and Silas, but Luke stays behind in Philippi. Notice that Luke no longer writes in the first person plural, we, has become they. Luke rejoins Paul in Acts 20 when Paul reaches Philippi on his third missionary journey. And again, the first person plural returns. So we begin chapter 17. Now, when they were traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, Ap Apollonia, sorry, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Okay, we're stopping only one verse to note that Paul doesn't, doesn't stop in the first two towns he visits. He just passes through. Given Paul's route, we know he's walking along a stretch of Roman highway known as the Ignatian Way, a major Roman road that crossed east-west from the Black Sea to the Adriatic Sea, about 600 miles long. Like all major Roman roads, it's about 20 feet wide and lined with polygon stones covered with hard-packed sand. In fact, if you've ever been over to the Holy Land, you can see some of these roads still in existence today. By the time Paul walked the length, it already existed for 300 years, so we know it's been around for a long time, and it's a major avenue for commerce. Paul walks from Philippi. He passes through two towns without even bothering to stop. The first two towns are not insignificant cities, yet Paul moves through them. If they were insignificant, we wouldn't even give, be given the names. Um, but he wants to make sure that people understand Paul stops in Thessalonica, where there's a synagogue of Jews. Remember, Paul would always try bringing the good news to the Jews 
and then when that was rejected, move on. Uh, there were no synagogues recorded in the first two towns, so there weren't, wasn't enough Jewish population he thought he could uh, reach. So it seems that Paul couldn't bring the gospel to the Jew first as God directed. He kept walking until he reached a town when he had an audience of Jews. So Paul lands in Thessalonica. It's a huge city, about 200,000 strong, and the capital of Macedonia. While Paul stayed here, he lived initially from support sent to him from the church in Philippi. Paul mentions the Philippian support in his letter to that city uh, in chapter 4. Before the support began to arrive, though, Paul supported himself through tent making. He was a tent maker. Kayam is uh, the word for tent maker. Um, and he describes that in his letters to Thessalonica. It's kind of hard to imagine that, you know, Paul, who is the great apostle to the Gentiles, stitching his tents to, to kind of kind of keep keep uh, uh, food coming in and, and, and keep on working. Uh, you'd think, okay, just the, the word of God would be powerful enough, but not when the church has not been established. It's certainly not. And so he did what he needed to do. And we continue. According to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths, Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. Again, as we've seen before, Paul goes to the synagogue to give the Jews the opportunity to know the Messiah that they had learned about, to say, He has come. Luke says something noteworthy, though, describing Paul's technique in this town. He reasoned with the Jews in the synagogue. The Greek word for reasoned is, is, is the root for the word dialogue. It's a rational discourse on Paul's part. He doesn't lecture them. He, he talks to them in a language they should be able to understand. He talks to them about a Messiah that they should have known about and points to Scripture and saying, see, Scripture says he's going to suffer and, and this is going to happen. Um, to win them over by their own evidence, by their own scripture, by their own history. Paul then offers eyewitness testimony. He's seen the risen Lord. He's experienced him face to face. Paul, again, uses the scriptures to make his arguments and says Jesus had to suffer and die. Doesn't make sense to us, but it's stuff that they didn't really want to think about. Remember, Jesus explained to his disciples that, you know, the Messiah is going to be suffering, put to death. Every time he, he said that, they never said, oh, what can we do? Can we stop this? They always, <laughs> sad to say, they always looked at, thought, you know, thought of themselves. I remember James and John saying, oh, um, instead of saying, gee, that's terrible. Can we can we keep this from happening? No, can we be number one and two in, this, in the kingdom? Can I, can I sit on one side and you on the other? It shows you how imperfect and how weak the apostles were. Kind of encouraging for us because it's like we can think, oh, I, would have, I wouldn't have said that, but eh, let's not get too cocky um, that we can be just as weak as they were. Um, and so it was with the Jews he was talking to. Yeah, it's in the scripture that the Messiah would suffer and, and, and be put to death uh, unjustly. But no one likes to think about that. Let's skip over to the happy parts. <laughs> and when he points it out, he says, you know, it's right there. You, you guys should know this. Um, they, some come to the realization that, yeah, there it is. And, and it in fact, has happened. Um, Paul doesn't give a miracle. He doesn't raise anyone from the dead. He doesn't offer to heal someone to prove his story. Um, miracles weren't given to the apostles to validate their story. It, it was to show the power of God when it needed to be shown. And these people um, knew the power of God. Um, Jews had the whole salvation history laid out for them. Um, but Paul doesn't make any effort to kind of do something outstanding because the Word of God in itself is outstanding. He makes his presentation 
and lays it out there. Um, as we see, some hear the message that Christ was crucified for us, uh, which is in keeping with what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, to Jews a stumbling block, and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. He knew that, remember, Jesus was asked for signs after he had just showed them signs. He fed 5,000. Well, if you just show us a sign, signs, even though the Jews are looking for signs, they're not willing, to, you know, there are many, some were willing to, to relate, but they'd already seen signs. So those who, who aren't willing to open up are going to say, well, show me something else. Well, show me something else. And then for Greeks, that the Savior would have to be put to death makes no sense at all. What, what kind of Savior is that? Why didn't he save himself? Um, but, as he writes to the Corinthians, there's those who are called, where faith is involved, even though it may not make sense to us, even though we might want, can you just give me another sign? <laughs> um, Christ is the power of God. He is the wisdom of God. It's not human power. It's not human wisdom. Um, and if that's what we're looking for, we're never going to see the risen Lord in that. We're never going to recognize Christ in that. So a period of time goes by. We, Luke skips over a bit. Um, though we can read about those intervening events in Paul's two letters. Um, but by verse 5, a large and committed church has been established in the city. We take it from verse 5 in chapter 17. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in uproar. And attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some of the brethren before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them. And they act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. They stirred up the crowds and the city authorities who heard these things. And when they received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. Fascinating <laughs> that the Jewish leaders who are jealous are pledging their oath to Caesar, who they hated, versus Jesus, who was a Jew. Well, he's not my Messiah. <laughs> and um, they don't realize how, how much apostasy they're showing by, by ditching everything for these pagans in order to get back at people who are trying to do the right thing. So they organize a conspiracy. Uh, we can look around the world, the countries, uh, uh, the states, even in... Canada and see a lot of rioting going on and uh, it doesn't take much to stir up an uproar, especially if people aren't happy. Um, this is a city of nearly 2,000 people, 200,000 people, I mean, and no high rises. So you imagine that it's just packed and spread out. Um, and Paul alludes to this period of persecution during his first letter to that city. As he writes to Thessalonians, he writes, For this reason we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God from which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ, Jesus, that are in Judea. For you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own compatriots, even as they did from the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all people, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so they may be saved, with the result that they always fill up with the measure of sins. But wrath has come upon them to the utmost. The men hired by the Jews were actually a regular fixture in many Roman towns. There were unemployed or underemployed lower-class individuals who loitered in the marketplaces and offered themselves for hire. They didn't really care what kind of job, and it seems kind of curious that, um, that 
there'd be a job as a professional heckler or a professional fan. And yet these men could be hired to follow someone around, to heckle them, or to applaud them, depending on whether you wanted to harass an individual or compliment them. Didn't matter to them. They were still making the same money. Um, the scripture describes them as men of a baser sort. Um, uh, some Bible translations says, as wicked men of the lowest rabble. That's where we get the term rabble rouser. Um, someone who rouses up the rabble is someone who hires the rabble to heckle or cause a disturbance. In this case, the Jews hired rabble rousers, and the effect was to start an uproar. They're looking for Paul. The crowd starts at the home of the man who's been hosting Paul and his traveling companions. They search, can't find him. I'm sure the house wasn't that big. It was probably easy to search. Um, they look around, they can't find Paul, so they do the next best thing. They, they remember, they're all fired up. They grab Jason. Well, you, you took him in, and so you're, you're just as bad. Um, and as he said, he's upsetting the whole world. Well, the world meant the probably the Roman Empire. Um, in other words, Paul and Jason are associated with causing a disturbance of the peace in the Roman Empire, um, accused of treason for convincing people to worship someone other than Caesar. Now, both of these charges are political in nature, so Jewish leaders have learned from their forerunners in Jerusalem that the Roman authorities wouldn't act against Jesus for religious charges, but rather for political charges. So they toss religion aside and say, look at their, their they're discrediting Caesar. Isn't that terrible? By this point, you can be sure Jason and other believers caught up in the melee are pretty nervous over what's happening. In a very real sense, Jason's life is on the line. So they offer him the opportunity to escape punishment if he makes a pledge or literally a, a payment of a bond. So Jason posted bail with the understanding that Paul and Silas would leave the city. If Jason failed at his word, he would fall for his bond and be subject to prosecution. Back to Acts. The brethren immediately set Paul, sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed along with a number of prominent Greek men and women. Clearly, Jason didn't want Paul to leave, but he had little choice under the circumstances. Um, he would lose his bond and probably lose his life. Uh, but he doesn't turn Paul in. He scoots him out under the cover of darkness. Paul himself wouldn't have wanted to leave, but he recognized God's will, um, setting up a situation where, okay, that's not, it's, it's one thing to jeopardize your own life, but when you're jeopardizing the lives of others, uh, maybe you're not doing God's will. Maybe that's us. So they realize it's not my call to make you a martyr. <laughs> that's that's between God and you and others. Um, so they leave at night, which was unusual and showed great urgency because you didn't travel at night. Things weren't safe. There, there were no street lights. Um, and, um, you know, robbers and thieves travel at night. Wild animals traveled at night. Um, but if we look at what Paul says in the second letter to the Thessalonians, uh, there may be evidence that Paul never returned for Jason's sake. In 2 Thessalonians 17, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 17. Um, but we, brethren, have been taken away from you for a short while, in person, not in spirit. We're all the more eager, with great desire, to see your face. For we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, and yet Satan hindered us. Paul's travel bring him further down the road to Berea. He's willing to stop in Berea because the town has a synagogue. And then, as we know, it's mentioned in Scripture. Um, it plays a relatively minor role in the Acts. In fact, uh, Cicero referred to Berea as this out-of-the-way city. So uh, a Roman uh, author said Berea is like sticks. And yet many Bible students have heard of Bereans because of one comment Luke makes regarding them. 
their unique practice of fact-checking their teachers. They didn't just sit there and say, give us more. They took the word that was given to them and chewed with it. It's like why Jesus spoke in, in parables, that we have something to hang on to and wrangle with. Um, and so he calls them more noble-minded than the Thessalonians because they put their faith into practice. Um, it's not just acceptance. It's like we know, we, we now understand. Well, it may not make sense here. We know, we've looked at it, and what you said is true. And that truth, not being something out there that was dropped into them, but exposed to them from their own experiences, um, would make them even stronger in the faith. Um, since we're over time, even though, sorry, we, you couldn't hear me in the beginning, I was showing you how lovely my backyard was, but uh, somehow Facebook doesn't like my backyard. So um, anyway, we'll pick up uh, talking a little bit more about the Bereans, who are just a little footnote in history, but um, what example they can give us as we continue on Paul's journey next week. I will see you then. Let's, and I guess I'll be here since, uh, since outside didn't seem to work. And it's getting there. Someone said I'm looking more like Santa Claus, so I think I look more like one of those those frill lizards that they have in Jurassic Park. But anyway, until quarantine virus is over, this will grow. See you next week. Stay safe and healthy. God bless.